Jimmy knew Prince since the early days in junior high uh, in Minneapolis. In the early 80s, Jimmy toured with Prince as part of his opening act. And uh, you were fired. We'll get to that part. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I definitely was. He was. Well, I mean, let's get to it now. He fired you because uh, he's what he's you, you performed with someone else and he got mad. We did. He, uh, Prince told us that he didn't want us to produce and write for any other acts. And we did. And he found out about it and subsequently fired us. Did you, keep, you tried to keep it secret from him? We, we actually did. As a matter of fact, it was like um, in the old days, of course, before Twitter and all that, everything was in Billboard magazine. We knew there was a picture of us in Billboard magazine working with these people. It was a group called the SOS Band, right? Yeah. And we were trying to hide every Billboard magazine we could find. Every time the manager would try to give him, oh, Prince, here's the new Billboard, we would like <laughs> snatch it and, like, and we're thinking, oh, he'll never see it. And of course, you know, he finally did. but. Was yeah. he a perfectionist like that? Because clearly loved the music, played yeah. all the instruments, oh, yeah. but on stage, and he, did he expect that from everybody? He expected excellence uh, from everybody in the pers maybe in the pursuit of perfection. Although I, I never thought of it like that. I always thought of it like um, he had the the discipline, like uh, James Brown, like the way James Brown used to operate his bands, where you had to be like ready at any moment to switch a song, change the key of a song, go to, you know, you had to be ready. And that was the thing. And he worked, worked, worked. But the great thing was his work ethic was beyond everybody else's. I always say it's like Michael Jordan, like the most talented guy walks into the gym and already has the talent anyway, but then he's gonna outwork you on top of it. That's yeah. the way Prince was. His first album, he played all 27 Un Insane. instruments. Unbelievable. So he, I mean, after the first album, somebody got to him and, and said, and listen, you're going to have to release a little of, you know. And, and sang all the parts, too. The harmonies on that album are amazing. The first song on the album is just a choral song. It's nothing but voice, a cappella. Yeah. It's amazing. Well, take me back to school then. So, like, music class, you're in, so yeah. what grade did you meet Prince in, first of all? I was, like, in seventh grade. I love this. Yeah. That's okay, Prince. Right okay, yeah. so what was he like as a kid first, and then tell me about musically, like, in the class with him? Well, as a kid, he was very, um, he was pretty quiet, actually, but he did play basketball, and he was actually a really good basketball player. He's not very tall. He was good? No, he was good. He was like Steph Curry. He, <laughs> Steph, he was like Steph Curry. Oh, he look had, at him to the right. He had handles, man. He had handles. And, uh, and the big fro. And the women loved the fro. Oh. And when he'd come up to court with the ball in his hand and the fro would go back and forth and the women would go, ah, Prince, ah, Prince. So but back then, the girls loved him oh even back in school. Absolutely. He famously said, uh, I like women more. Women understand me better. They're less intimidated by me. What was his relate? What, what was he like in school, you know, with, with guys? Did, did the kids, the boys like him or was he teased and bullied? I don't think he was ever teased because he was talented. Everybody knew he was so talented. So I think it was, that was part of what it was. And I know for me, the connection was always musical. I would, I, we would always be in a, in a room with you know, keyboards and music, and that was like his environment, and that's where he loved it. And I always thought of myself as a pretty good piano player back in the day. <laughs> But man, he played rings around me. It, was, it wasn't even, it was crazy. And then he'd jump on a different instrument. Like, I played drums. So I got on the drums one day, and I thought, I'm playing, right? And he jumps on the guitar and kills it. Then he goes behind the drum set and kills the drums. And I don't even want to get on the drums anymore. I mean, it was, it was so otherworldly. And self-taught. And self-taught. Well, he had a musical. His dad, I know, was very musical, as my father was, too. I mean, so I think we had that in our genes. But... Just a different level for him, different level. Did you spend much time at uh, Paisley Park? Did you ever go in? in yeah, we used to go, um, you know, he would always do these sh late shows, and I'm talking late. I'm like, you had to be maybe two in the morning, three in the morning, he yeah. would get, actually get started. But it was a great hang. He always wanted to have people around and people, uh, he was always what I call a gatherer. He always gathered great groups of people together to listen to music. And I thought that was very cool, very special, and particularly being in Minneapolis, you know, because people would his travel music. all, well, his music, but also music that he appreciated. You know, he was a big Sly and the Family Stone fan, a big yeah. James Brown fan. But growing up in Minneapolis, which was very, probably 3% black, probably around the time we grew up, it was also Fleetwood Mac and, and that kind of stuff. So he had those kind of influences, and that's where you hear the amalgamation of all the musics come together in his style. Was he happy, do you think? Did he appreciate his success, or did he always think he could do more? He was always very driven, but um, I think, yeah, I think he was happy. I, I, when The days we were around him, which was now the early 80s, professionally, we were around him in the time, our band, The Time, and we were, you know, we were competitors, but we were also teammates at the same time, you know. Um, he seemed very happy during that period of time, I can tell you that. Um, and he just loved music. It was all, everything that drove him was about the music. Did the divide ever uh, heal between the two of you? When's the last, did, Oh, absolutely. You know, when, when did it, you speak to him? 
I probably hadn't spoken to him probably for about three or four months, but we were fine with each other. Actually, it was interesting because it was kind of the best thing that ever happened to us. When he fired us, the record that we were working on became Terry and mine first number one record, a song called Just Be Good To Me. Yeah. So it was one of those things where, in a, in a sense, he fired us, but in a way he almost set us free. You know, like the, the baby, the mom kicking the baby bird out the nest and going, you fly, you got it. How, how bad were his hips? I mean, did you, I mean? I knew he had, well, it's interesting, because Morris Day, the lead singer from the time, actually had hip replacement surgery. And we did a, a tour, like a reunion tour with the time around 2009, 2010. And I remember Morris was raving about it. And he said, I got to tell Prince, I should have done this a lot earlier, because it really worked well for him. So I knew that um, he, he had had the uh, surgery that I thought he had, and um, I just figured that, Did you know, Prince get the surgery? Because it's, I, it's confusing. I, I, I assumed that he did only because I know that, you know, Morris, and Morris and Prince were very good friends, and I figured that he had probably had the surgery, but maybe, maybe he didn't. If he didn't, he was in pain, like, yeah. unbelievable, because that's the way Morris felt, too. And Morris, when he had the surgery, then he felt like he was a whole different person. What you know? about health-wise, when you heard the news, he's known to be this vegan, yeah. super healthy. There's all reports, all speculation. We won't know till the autopsy. But right. did you know personally, had you heard anything that he wasn't feeling good? or? I hadn't heard anything and, of course, was concerned when I heard about, you know, the plane making the landing because it was so close to the Twin Cities. I mean, we're talking about, you know, that's the Quad Cities area of Illinois. That's only, you know, 40 minutes from the Twin Cities. So I knew something was up there, but I assumed, you know, when they said the flu or, or whatever, I figured, you know, de dehydration or any of those, he pushes himself really hard. Yeah. He's, a, he's a hard worker. And I figured that's what it was. Um, in my knowledge of him, he's never really been a, a drug taker of any sort. Um, he has always lived a, a very clean lifestyle, very healthy lifestyle. So that, I don't know. Yeah, confusing. Yeah. His outfits, oh man. Oh. I mean, when you first, uh, was he dressing like this as a kid when he would, I mean, we just saw his I first TV appearance. I love the parents. thigh highs and the thigh tiny oh, yeah, right? undies and, and, <laughs> and, you know, a, a plunger down to the navel. He knew how to rock it. Velvet yeah. ruffles and, I mean, yeah. did you ever just say, Dude. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was very, no, I mean, and, and, and at school, no, he didn't dress like that, obviously, but, but, um, but no, certainly in his, in his more rock and roll life. I remember I, I went and auditioned <sighs> for him, his band and stuff, and uh, I didn't, obviously, I didn't get the gig, but um, he was always dressed impeccably. Like, he always looked like a rock star. Before he even had albums out or anything, he just had that look and that charisma and that whole thing. So I think it's always been important to him the way he looks. I like he was an athlete. You tell us he's a baller. I love that picture. He's a baller. Great athlete. He's a baller. There was, hands. there was a studio called Sunset Sound we used to record at, and it was just not a whole court, but just a pole in the middle. And he had these shots he would do off the roof, off a pole, oh, off the whatever that nobody could do. Nothing and he'd beat but that. everybody. Exactly. Uh, Jimmy, that's last really question: cool. What is your favorite Prince song of all time? Oh, you gotta be kidding me. Um, I'm gonna go only because I was just listening to it is a song called Lady Cab Driver, which I Lady absolutely Cab love. Driver. It's on the 1999 album, check it out. On 99, See, I funky, feel dorky, I record. go Delirious, Little Red Corvette. I'm so cliche, That's I gotta dive deeper. That's the obvious one. come know. on, kid. Come on. You know, my favorite, Jimmy Jam. my favorite is, uh, it hasn't come out yet. It's in one of his vaults. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh trust me. Trust me, the, so vaults, much the vaults are amazing. Would he you want seen that release though? Oh, yeah. You've been inside, you've seen him? How many yeah. songs are in there? Probably thousands. But Jimmy, Woo. would he want those released? He's a perfectionist. Yes. We, we talked. We actually talked about but that. Not one now, of our, maybe. I don't know, but what, we had a conversation about that, and and we told Prince we wanted to produce him. That that was one of the things on our bucket list. And he said, he laughed, and he said, well, "Okay, what would you do?" And I said, first thing we do is we go down to the vault and we get all those records because there's Time records in there, there's Sheely records, there's great records in there. We said, let's get those records and start working with those. And he said, okay. Wow. So I think he, yeah, and it's it's great music. Oh my God, I'm so excited for Jimmy that. could talk uh, all oh, day. Oh God, Jimmy, so many more uh, questions. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jimmy. Absolutely.